It's my pleasure to welcome uh, to um, this and tomorrow's workshop on importating a people's race into uh, today's keynote lecture. Before I turn the podium over to the um, organizers and our keynote speaker, let me say a few words about the program here. Um, Armenian Studies came, uh, came into being about 40 years ago with the establishment of two endowed chapters, <laughs> the Alex Manoubian Professorship in Armenian History and History Department, and the Marie Manoubian Professorship in Language and Literature, located today in the Department for Middle East Studies. And the production in languages and arts is maintained by the Center of Armenian Studies here under the umbrella of the International Institute. <laughs> it's sustained by communities, or large, um, small, but dynamic. And so the center has been able to play an important role in the practice of Armenian studies, and not least to um, its long um, running postdoctoral fellowship um, for the community in support of which we can thank the Manukian family. Every year, we host um, two postdoctoral fellows who conduct the research here. Um, they teach a course in their specialization. Um, they get to, to organize a workshop around their research. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Wolf, our postdoctoral fellow in Armenian history and the organizer of negotiating ambiguous race. And he will then introduce his keynote speaker. Dr. Wolf is a Roman historian holding a PhD in classic at Ohio State. And we've been very excited to, to talk with him about how he decided to push the boundaries of classics um, by focusing on the experience of subject populations. In this case, in the far east of the Roman Empire, in particular, the Syriac and Armenian populations. He analyzes um, native terms for Roman institutions as with the different literary genres in Syria, primarily and in Armenia, <coughs> to show how their experience emerged and reversed in significant ways. And we'll look forward to hear more um, about his findings tomorrow. Um, but now, please join me in welcoming him to the podium to today's evening. Thank you for and navigating the horrible weather. Uh, Daniel Diafralta is an associate professor of classics at Princeton University. A historian of the Roman Republic and the ordinance of Roman imperialism, his research explores Mediterranean and global histories of citizenship and migration. His most recent book, Divine Institutions, Religions, and Community in the Middle Roman Republic, received the 2022 American Historical Association's Herbert Baxter Adams Prize, which is awarded annually for the most distinguished word of scholarship in English in the field of European history. Divine Institutions proposes a new reinterpreting, reinterpretation of Republican Rome, tracing how the Switzerland united a growing and diversified republic in the fourth and third centuries BCE. Adams' work explores the continuing relevance of the Greek and Roman past in the modern world, including the legacy of classical antiquity and the contemporary curriculum, hip-hop's engagement with the classics, and parallels between Greek and Roman perspectives on immigrants and nativist movements in 19th century American politics. His explorations spanning multiple men are united by a deep concern with patterns of cultural and intellectual exchange, and a commitment to demonstrating the merits of new approaches that can better illuminate those patterns. He is a staunch believer in the importance of public scholarship, and the deconstruction of practices that have raced the study of the ancient world and the classics and the modern academy. He is a dedicated educator who is motivated by the sense that writing and teaching have a vital role to play in the pursuit of social justice, and by the conviction that classics and classicists should and can. Yeah, all right. In 
the service of setting up the frame, I am going to offer a whirlwind overview of recent scholarship on race and race making in Greco Roman antiquity, and then turn to the first of the two passages that will form the focus of my talk. Much of the modern scholarship on race in Greco Roman antiquity has focused on two related questions. First, were there concepts and practices of race and racialization active in the ancient Mediterranean? So, and two, how do scholars avoid the risk of anachronism in the identification and analysis of these concepts and practices? Until fairly recently, literature on these issues tilted strongly in favor of somatic or phenotypic approaches to race, dealing minimally, if at all, with definitions of race and racial formation that don't accord primacy to the inscription of race on the body. As an appetizer for a different approach to race and racialization, I will set up over the course of this talk a focus on the interiority or psychic dimensions of race. And in this work, I'm going to follow the lead of scholars such as Caroline Heng, the invention of race in the European Middle Ages, in envisioning race making in pre modern societies as a far more flexible and multi dimensional process. Let me quote from Jerry Heng's definition of race. Race is one of the primary names we have, a name we retain for the strategic, epistemological, and political commitments it recognizes that is attached to a repeating tendency of the gravest import to demarcate human beings through differences among humans that are selectively essentialized as absolute and fundamental in order to distribute positions and powers differentially to human groups. Race-making thus operates as specific historical occasions in which strategic essentialisms are posited and assigned through a variety of practices and pressures so as to construct a hierarchy of peoples for differential treatment. My understanding thus is that race is a structural relationship for the articulation and management of human differences rather than a substantive content. The conflation of race with skin color is a trap that even the most sophisticated recent treatments of ancient and medieval racial constructs have fallen into. Of course, that's not to say that the payoffs of attending to skin color as a register of racial differentiation in antiquity have been fully exhausted. So for instance, critical race theory has lately and very suggestively been brought to bear on the representation of blackness as a somatic feature in Herodotus and new work on epidermal racialization in Greek tragedy undertaken by Sarah Darbo has been exceptionally generative. But there is still work, I think, to do in developing an account of race in Mediterranean antiquity that attends equally to the physical and non-physical dimensions of Heng's definition. To realize this objective, there are two preliminaries that need to be squared away. The first concerns the place of race, racism, and racialization in ancient Mediterranean history. It's often noted, sometimes as an objection to the enterprise of studying race in antiquity, that the communities of the ancient Mediterranean do not in their writings or material practices have racial structures that are fully analogous to or compatible with those of global modernity. The usual foundation of this objection is the seeming, I stress seeming absence of explicitly anti-black racism in antiquity, and more generally the absence of taxonomic racial categories that are organized by polar reference to blackness and whiteness. But this objection is a shaky one as Denise McCoskey and others have shown, and it certainly doesn't justify the attempt to sidestep critical inquiry into race in antiquity by adopting the notion of ethnicity instead. This is something about which McCoskey has also written quite excellently. For one, if contemporary racial categories didn't exist in antiquity or not inherited in antiquity, this doesn't mean that race and racism as heuristic tools are inapplicable to antiquity. Hi folks. Consider by way of instructive parallel the validity of economics as a methodology for studying the ancient Mediterranean world. Ancient Greeks and Romans, as many of you will know, don't have any concept that corresponds neatly to our 20th or 21st century notions of economics. The terms oikonomia and ta oikonomika primarily attach to household management, but without any more sweeping or encompassing extension into what we usually associate with economics, credit, markets, currency, and the like. Obviously, though, the absence of such a concept doesn't preclude our talking about the economies of the ancient world. Mutatis mutandis, the same holds true for race, I think. The second issue, though, has to do with the positionality of scholars working on race and racialization in antiquity. In 2009, Shelley Haley insisted on the value of critical race theory because it challenges the experiences of whites as the norm 
while at the same time it centers its conceptual framework in the experiences of people of color, end quote. The history of scholarship on the ancient Roman Mediterranean has been marked by both the willful evasion of race racism as productive categories for historical analysis and by the importation of racist because white supremacist and normatively white centering ideas into its disciplinary practices. These are two sides of the same coin. One consequence is that the field as a whole and its practitioners haven't refined their ability to understand how they enact white centering norms, which leaves them in a poor intellectual position to study or document the racial norms of Greco-Roman antiquity, a space-time unity for which whiteness was not a hegemonic racial discourse. This deficit is traceable to the habit of curating and disseminating resources for research and teaching in classics and classics adjacent fields that blithely ignore the methods of inquiry that have been painstakingly built up and elaborated by scholars of color working in other fields and times. It's apparent too in the inability of many classicists and historians to grasp properly the uniquely pernicious properties of anti-Black racism, as Brian Rainey has noted, and Euro-American settler colonialism that bear on their own status as knowledge producers. Facing up to these shortcomings means at a minimum thinking quite carefully about questions of epistemic authority. As brought to life in the work of Prescott Weinstein on prestige asymmetry and white empiricism. Under the banner of Black Scholarship Matters, Benny Liu has encouraged scholars in biblical and early Christian studies to ask whose scholarship counts as scholarship in my guild? Question mark. And for this project's bigger frame, it matters a lot who gets invited into the conversation of approaches and methods to develop for the study of race and racialization in the ancient world. There are three important and recent developments that merit emphasizing because they hold out hope of executing research into race and race making that engages with non-classicists in a critical and non-extractive manner. First, as already alluded to, biblical and early Christian studies have seen an outpouring of publications in recent years that decenter whiteness in favor of conceptually more fluent and ethically more rigorous approaches to the historical study of race. While the publications of Denise Kimber Buell and Laura Nasrallah have been pioneering in this respect, it is the work of Black and Asian American scholars that has invested contemporary minoritized racial positions with the epistemic power to read ancient texts afresh. I am thinking in particular of the work of Mitzi Smith and others. Buell's alertness to the generative potential of a paradigm of haunting as one prospects for darkening the discipline, Buell's phrase, is especially intriguing, though not as Maya Katrositz has now observed clear difficulty. The second development is the emergence of an institutional infrastructure for pre-modern race studies and pre-modern critical race studies. This distinction between pre-modern race studies and pre-modern critical race studies is one set out in a fantastic talk slash lecture by Margo Hendricks, and is at the core of the Race Before Race Collective's approach to the study of pre-modern race and racialization. This infrastructure's appearance has coincided with a rising commitment to the study of race and racism on the part of intellectual historians and historians of scholarship working in multiple fields. And that's the third development of interest to me. With those developments now set out, I turn to the substance of the talk. I'm gonna focus, as I mentioned, on two passages from a first century C Latin novel, and this is Petronius the Satirical. The first passage is a teaser or a treatment of disposition or hexus as a racialized design. I will simply present the passage. I will draw your attention to its standout features and I will invite you to reflect on some takeaways. For the second passage though, also taken from this novel, a fuller exposition will be necessary. And to tee up the reading of that passage, I need to explain why working through theories of racial melancholy and affect can help us gain purchase on the psychological properties of racialization and why the institution of Roman manumission in particular ought rightly to be understood as a racializing process. So here's the first passage, which I will read. The background to it is that in the midst of a sea journey, the characters Eumolpus, Giton, and Enculpius discover that two of their most formidable enemies are traveling on the same ship and panicking, they fumble for an escape plan. Here's Enculpius's idea. I present the translation of Kennedy, Goldman, and Roy. Consider this plan I just thought of. Eumolpus' as literary man is sure to have some in. With this means, let us change our color from head to foot. 
And so, like Ethiopian slaves, we will also be at your service, cheerful without the severity of tortures. And by changing the color of our bodies, we will trick our enemies. Why not, said Giton. And while you're at it, circumcise us so that we look like Jews, pierce our ears so that we imitate Arabs, and chalk our faces so Gaul thinks we are her citizens. As if this new color alone could undo our shape, and it were unnecessary that many things be consistent to make a successful deception from every angle. Suppose that the stain of dye applied to our faces can last for some time. Imagine that a sprinkling of water will not leave any spot on our body and that our clothes will not stick to the ink, which happens often even when glue is not applied. But tell me, can we fill out our lips for that hideously swollen look? Can we change our hair with curling tongs? Can we cut up our foreheads to leave scars? Can we make ourselves bowling? Can we bend our ankles onto the ground or trim our beards to a foreign cut? Artificial color stain the body without changing the shape. Listen to the solution of a scared person who us tie our heads and our clothes and drown ourselves in the deep ocean. This is an extraordinary and gutting entry point into the complexity of racial assignments in antiquity and into contemporary receptions and contestations of those assignments. The work of several generations of scholars on ancient race has emphasized, as I noted a few minutes ago, that if we're looking in Greek and Latin literature of the early empire for an indexing of whiteness as we understand it to the bodies and figures of Romans, we won't quite find it. And in any case, as this passage makes clear, skin color is only one vector for racial differentiation and racial assignments. There are other things that also form part of the economy of racialization in this period. Racialization entails a disposition or ordering of a range of properties. It is a texas. It is a way of organizing the full scope of the body's representations, including ornamentation and dress, in order to communicate a racial identity. However, the important thing to emphasize is that, as other parts of Petronius's novel make clear, this is a hexus that is not solely reducible to externally visible dimensions. There are internal properties that accompany it. But in order to talk about these internal properties, we now have to pivot in a slightly different direction and look at an earlier point in Petronius's narrative where the internal properties are brought out by explicit engagement of the life art of the enslaved manual. As prolegomena to this, I need to say a few words first about the stigmatization of formerly enslaved persons in Roman society and culture. It has seemed clearly mistaken to hold that the manumitted generally enjoyed the same civic and legal privileges as the freeborn, as Orlando Patterson and many commentators on ancient slavery have realized. Disagreements on the degree and enforceability of the stigma persist, though. The presumption of the macula servitutis, the stain of slavery, did erect at least in theory social obstacles for those enslaved persons who made it to manumission, even if questions remain about its practical repercussions. Differences in the degree of stigmatization come to be structured into the legal machinery of manumission, at least beginning with Augustus, the first princeps. But for the historian of Roman slavery, the gap between law and life is not always easy to bridge. How do people actually live with the macula servitutis is not as straightforwardly addressed or valuable. Upon manumission, public slaves, slaves that were not held by private individuals, but were actually held by townships or municipalities or the Roman state, may have enjoyed more privileged outcomes than privately held and freed and slave persons, but a recent study has called this century old assumption into question. What does seem beyond debate is that in resistance to the stigma of slavery, Roman free persons craft a material culture and a representational discourse that is rich in individual and collective affirmation. So much so that over time, this culture and this discourse follows the upward trajectory of socially mobile free persons into the upper strata of Roman society. How formally enslaved persons internally negotiate their transition from slavery to freedom is at first blush not the kind of question that one can answer on the basis of available evidence. It might not seem all that fruitful to probe the degree to which they internalize and psycholo psychologically contest slavery stigma. 
But what I'm going to suggest by looking at Petronius the Satirica is that by zeroing in on the speech of one of the freed persons who appears in the Cainatrimalchionis, we can see how Roman manumission interacts on a psychic level with a very specific form of structural domination. And that form of structural domination is race. The dominant emotional register for this interaction, I'll suggest, is melancholy. And to the analysis of that melancholy, we need to bring tools drawn from work on Athens. The melancholy of the Roman freed person encompasses several different affects. Not only survivors' guilt and paranoia that are bred and stoked in a system that denies the majority of enslaved persons access to manumission, but systematic and reiterated interpolation as the other to the Roman freeborn individual. It's this interpolation that requires, I think, the application of a theory of racial melancholy. But in order to set that up properly, I need first to justify my recourse to this theory and to the conceptual superstructure of which it forms part before proceeding to its application by analysis of the passage in Petronius. So in recent decades, psychoanalysis has been worked really hard in histories of early modern racial formations. Where it hasn't made all that many inroads as a method for interrogating the subjective constitution of race is in classics and ancient history, even though the tide of publications on the cultural psychology of ancient Greece and Rome rises higher and higher, and even though there are plenty of classicists who are working on Freud and post-Freudian encounters with classics essential to the history of psychology and the history of classical reception. While for Freud himself, racial formations were not an act of sight of inquiry, some of his contemporaries did turn their attention to the collision of melancholy and race. In the 80 years since Freud's passing, theories of racial melancholy have gained ahead of steam, chiefly but not only in histories of racism and colonialism. Leading the way in Anglophone circles are Asian American scholars such as Frey Chow, David Eng, Shin Yi Han. In creative nonfiction encounters with racial melancholy, one might also cite the essays of Kathy Parson. But in much of what follows, I'm going to take my cues from Annie Cheng, whose 2000 monograph on racial melancholy perspicaciously maps the terrain. Opening this monograph with a discussion of the Clark experiment with dolls that informed the final disposition of Brown v. Board of Ed and oriented in general around the landscape of racial differentiation and trauma in the post-Brown United States, Cheng's work proceeds from the claim that the vocabulary of grievance, I quote her, and its implied logic of comparability and compensation that constitute so much of American political discourse has ironically deflected attention away from a serious look at the more immaterial, unquantifiable repository of public and private grief that has gone into the making of the so-called minority subject and that sustains the notion of one nation, end quote. For Chang, this grief is best grasped through an extension of Freud's insights in mourning and melancholia concerning the ego's coupling to melancholy. In Cheng's hands, this Freudian notion, which, quote, designates a chain of loss, denial, and incorporation to which the ego is born by, quote, taking in the other made ghostly, end quote, is well suited to probing racialization in the United States, which she understands as the institutional process, of, quote, producing a dominant standard white national ideal, which is sustained by the exclusion yet retention of racialized others. The history of American national idealism has always been caught in this melancholic bind between incorporation and rejection, end quote. Chang is also motivated to ask the question that, to quote her again, Freud does not ask, what is the subjectivity of the melancholic object? Is it also melancholy? And what will we uncover when we resuscitate it? In other words, what implications do insights into the melancholic origins of American racial national identity hold for the study of racialized subjects. The complexly internalized racial melancholia that Chang analyzes is also a form of education. It instructs people in how to orient themselves towards the world. But apprehending its penetration into the experiences of the raced and racialized and its participation in what Judith Butler has aptly christened the psychic life of power requires us to go still deeper to, and I'll quote Chang again, the deep sense of how that sadness as a kind of ambulatory despair or manic euphoria, conditions life for the disenfranchised and indeed constitutes their identity and shapes their subjectivity. 
This deep sense, Chen contends, is recoverable at least in part by attending to fantasy as a zone of mediation between her words, sociality and ontology. Subjected to psychoanalysis, racial fantasy comes more fully to the fore as embedded not in a strictly and fixatedly linear historical account, but as a spectral history that's populated with ghosts, a haunted history. Having now recapitulated those aspects of Cheng's study that bear most directly on my project, let me now spell out how I propose to apply this model of racial melancholy to the psychosocial history of enslaved persons who are manumitted in the Roman world, liberty and liberti, and who through the process of manumission experience a kind of racialization. This application is staked to several claims, and I can't give their full justification here, but we can definitely talk about them in the Q&A. The first and most fundamental, as you will have gathered, is that Roman manumission is a species of racial formation. Or to package this idea in somewhat different language, but with a roughly equivalent thrust, racialization structures the progression from enslavement to freedom. With this claim, I'm dipping my toes into a long running debate about racialization in the ancient Mediterranean, whose main outlines I set out a few minutes ago. Whether one subscribes to the idea that color prejudice and biological racism don't exist in Greco-Roman antiquity, or that cultural prejudice or somatic idealizations or a series of proto-racism, types of proto-racism do exist, meaningful consideration of race as an affective system is virtually absent from classicist ventures into the history of race in antiquity. Working with a practice that reaches back to Franz Fanon, the late Jose Esteban Munoz wrote trenchantly about feeling brown and the gridding of mental states of depression within racial matrices, a core feature of that multi-scalar operation of this identification by which minoritized subjects wrestle with and attempt to locate spaces or resistance in majoritarian structures that threaten to suffocate them. Munoz encourages readers to bend Gayatri Chakravorty's Spivak celebrated query, can the subaltern speak towards a more inwardly focused handling of social relationality? Quote, how does the subaltern feel? How might subalterns feel each other? At its core, this project seeks to determine whether contemporary states of feeling brown can be found in the melancholy of the manumitted and to use that as a proxy for thinking about racialization in the ancient Mediterranean. While recent critiques of the racialized underpinnings of trauma and of complex interiorities could well serve as a foundation for a still more expansive reconstruction of the interrelationships of race making, psychopathology and enslavement in the Roman world, I'll defer that reconstruction to focus narrowly on melancholy's attachment to Roman manumission and to the contention that racial melancholy was generated by and reproduced through the transition from enslavement to emancipation and that the manumitted ought therefore to be understood as melancholic objects turned subjects. I understand the constitution of the racialized subject under the affective sign of melancholy, not as dependent on the phenotypic description of race, but is bound up with a libidinal economy that defines slaveness and slavehood as a site for race-making violence. So much of the teaser, now for the text itself by way of a brief overview of its handling. I am most interested in this part of today's presentation in a selection from the Cana Trimalchionis, the episode headlined by the extravagantly wealthy Friedman Trimalchio that has been at the center of efforts to understand over the past few decades, the relationship between the fictionalizing representation of slavery in texts like the Tronis Satirica and the realities of slavery in the world of the early Roman Empire. Afric studies, I think, can be helpful in confronting one deficit of the scholarship, excellent though it has been, that has trained its sights on the Canaan. The reflexive tendency to normalize or foreground the expectations and imperatives of freeborn elites. In the spirit of other reparative readings of Latin literature that have explicitly tried to center the perspectives of the enslaved and manumitted, 
I hope that what I can do through my reading is to keep my eyes fixed on the internal logic of the value system that is voiced by one of Schumacher's fellow freedmen and on the patterning of that logic around racial melancholy as a core design. The text is the Friedman Hermerus' eruption at the side-splitting laughter of the freeborn Ascyltus. And I will read out this text in English, the Latin you can follow on the slides. What are you laughing at? Hermerus said, you muttonhead. Are my master's good things not good enough for you? You're richer and used to better living, I guess. As I hope to have the spirits of this place on my side, if I'd been sitting next to him, I should have put a stop on his bleeding by now. A nice fruit, bellum pomum, who laughs at others. Some lazy ass, I don't know who, not worth his own piss. In fact, once I've urinated around him, he won't know where to take refuge. By Hercules, I'm not accustomed to get so quickly into heat, but in rotten flesh, worms will breed. He laughs. What has he got to laugh about? Did his father pay solid gold for him when he was a baby? A Roman knight, are you? Well, I'm a king's son. Then why have you been a slave? Because I went into service to please myself and preferred being a Roman citizen to going on paying taxes as a provincial. And now I hope I live such a life that no one can jeer at me. I am a man among men. I walk about bareheaded. I owe nobody a brass farthing. I have never been in the courts. No one has ever said to me in public, pay me what you owe me. I have bought a few small clods and collected a little plate. I have to feed 20 bellies and a dog. I ransom my fellow slave lest someone should wipe his hands on her. I paid a thousand denarii for my own freedom. I was made a priest of Augustus and excused the fees. I hope to die so that I need not blush in my grave. But are you so full of business that you have no time to look behind you? You can see a louse on others, but not the big tick on yourself. No one finds us comic but you. There's your schoolmaster, older and wiser than you. He likes us. You're a child just weaned. You cannot squeak out moo or ma. You're a clay pot, a wash leather and water. Softer, not better. If you're richer, then have two breakfasts and two dinners a day. I prefer my reputation to any rich. So wrap up. Whoever had to ask me twice? I was a slave for 40 years and nobody knew whether I was slave or free. I was a long-haired boy when I came to this place. They hadn't built the town hall then. But I worked hard to please my master, a fine, dignified man whose fingernail was worth more than your whole body. And there were people in the house who put out a foot to trip me up here and there. But still, thanks to the genius of that man, I persevered. These are real victories. For being born free is as easy as saying, come here. But why do you look scared at me now like a goat in a field of vetch? Hermes's abuse in this vein continues for a while longer, directed not only at the freeborn Ascyltos, but also at his companion Gito, until Trimalchio, overseeing the festivities at this dinner, has him piped down in order to offer his heterodox take on the Trojan myth cycle to the accompaniment of troop mock fighting and reciters to come. While the interpretation I'm about to advance can be extended with equal profit to the continuation of Hermes' tirade, I am going to limit myself to the sections that I quoted on these slides because these sections capture all the essential features of the theory of melancholic affect that is of interest to me. With its sprinkling of proverbs, the opening sequence offers a surprisingly methodical exposition of the grief and anger that the free person is presumed to negotiate most of all when in the presence of potential or actual interpretation as formerly enslaved. Why were you a slave? My interpretation will seek to supplement and at the same time problematize another affect that has recently received more sustained attention in epigraphically grounded studies of Roman free persons. Pride, and especially pride in one's crown. Here are some of the most immediately salient features of Hermerus's diatribe as well as some of the less obvious ones that come to the surface on more careful inspection. One, paranoia. This is the paranoia that takes shape around the continuous interplay of hypervisibility and invisibility 
in the formation of the free person's self. This is a paranoia that stems not only from the sense of not being in on the joke, but from the experience, and I will quote now two of the theorists that I mentioned in setting up my framework, of having one's reality belittled so many times as to lose confidence. It is the self-doubt that gives rise to, quote, the minor feelings of paranoia, shame, irritation, and melancholy. Laughter, which is taken to reflect the dismissive judgment of the life that Hermeros and his fellow co-liberty lead, is understood to flow from a person who is beati or more fortunate, perhaps even of a question status, to his presumed social inferior. In other words, Hermeros' touchiness flows out of the recognition, mediated through the anticipation of mocking laughter, that his structural location in Roman society exposes him to disparagement. He doesn't need to be interpolated directly by a skill toss or anyone else at the dinner party for that matter, because he has been so effectively interpolated as a racialized subject with the conjoined processes of enslavement and manumission that laughter in his general direction will do the trick. His reaction to this laughter ranges in two directions, both of which are notable. The first is the threat of violence, which is verbalized as the infliction of physical violence on a speaking subject who is animalized, ut ego si secundum ilum discumberem, yam ili balatum clusissem, then as the prospect of disrespect in the form of a nice little urine treatment for the laughing Askiltos, whom Hermas invectively assimilates to urine itself. And Barrett Schmeling in his commentary is correct to pair up the verb curcumeura here and later on in the Cana with the use of urine as a magical element for confinement. The violence that we're asked to envision is a restriction on movement. More of interest to me is that the swerve between animalizing violence and experimentalized disrespect unmasks in quick succession one of the core instabilities in the psychic development of the self under the dehumanizing objectifications of Roman slavery, and that is the indeterminate animacy of the enslaved self and of the manumitted self that carries that previously enslaved self's traces. This indeterminate animacy had been presaged in the first of the Canis three manumission scenes preceding Hermeros' explosion, where the recipient of freedom is not a human being, but a boar. From its presumed origins in the humiliations of enslavement itself, foremost among them the enslaved's exposure to animal life and human waste, the indeterminacy of this animacy is further reinforced by the excrementalizing subtext of the stain of slavery itself. The inflection of Hermeros' vocabulary with these markers of objection thus makes plain the interrelation of languaging with racialization as a biosemiotics that are smuggled into the violent assertion of difference. But it is the second direction taken by Hermeros' outburst that discloses even more about the melancholic affects of Roman manumission. He launches into an autobiography. The turn to autobiography is striking here not only because it activates in miniaturized form, those inset tales, those elaborate versions in the satirica thicken the novel's plot and its variety and versatility. It's interesting and important because it participates in the production of freedom and identity through fabulation, mirroring through a glass darkly the clustering of fictions around the figure of the manumitted in Roman culture. The move to autobiography is implicated in the production and projection of an affect that, if following the lead of David Eng and Shimhi Han, we look for race as, quote, a historical effect of the social relations between objectification and subjectification, end quote, we can categorize as a racialized affect in the expression that it receives through the autobiographical movements of Hermeros's diatribe. In some other writing, I've tried to work out the intuition that certain forms of autobiographical performance respond to and reiterate structural violence um, by looking at select ancient and modern accounts of displacement and migratory trauma. Jimmy was very generous to me in his introduction by referring to those. Autobiography is pried from the mouths of the structurally disadvantaged or victimized who then have to reenact their tale of dispossessed woe at every one of the spatial and temporal checkpoints at which their admissibility to freedom is policed. In the face of this pressure, there arise powerful and eventually overwhelming incentives to modify components of that autobiography through embellishments or omissions or some combination thereof. Each of these threads is stitched into Hermeros' autobiographical fabric, beginning with the enunciation of the interpolating question. Why did you, why were you enslaved? 
The charge of the verb Sir Weira has benefited from careful study in recent years. Herman Ross's autobiographical response stages its defiance of the verb's imputed sneer on several levels. A, in the deep past, before my immediate past, I was actually born to distinction. From a psychoanalytic perspective, arguably no aspect of plucky self-fashioning calls out for, a, for more scrutiny than the production of a high status pedigree in the face of shame. But in claiming a life and social identity before slavery, Herman Ross does also flout, or at least attempts to flout, one signature imposition of Pattersonian social death, natal alienation and deracination. From a high status background, he exercises the choice to enter into slavery in the hope of one day becoming a Roman citizen. All because he didn't want to be a taxpaying provincial. It may be productive to read Herman Ross's assertion of pedigree and agency as an attempt to neutralize the suspicion that he was sold into slavery by indigent parents, or we could postulate other possibilities too. Also remarkable is the representation of slavery with the hope of manumission into Roman citizenship as a means of fleeing the fate of the tributaries. With Rome's imperial relationship to the provinces being figured as a species of enslavement in literature and representational media by the time of the satiricus composition, as the work of Miles Lalonde and others has shown, Homer Ross is claiming to have made a choice between two forms of juridically and imperially sanctioned exploitation. Yet this assertion of agency soon reveals itself as a device for managing rage-inducing memories of subjection. It is a technology for othering and displacing the shame of enslavement by positing a true and originally elite self who remained unshaken by slavery's trials. In other words, slavery, according to this account, doesn't alter his subjectivity. Although paradoxically, the trials of slavery, as contrasted with the relative ease of being born free, are exalted as the where akla of life. A few sentences after his boastful admission of self-enslavement comes the revelation that he had been a slave for 40 years, that he, like his host Trimalchio, had been sexually exploited by his owner, and that his dealings with the fellow members of his familia had been fraught as others tried to obstruct them from achieving his goals. However, in Atawi, he came through these ordeals intact, swimming out of these tempests, in a statement of perseverance that is routed through a maritime metaphor that trails the seaborne traffic of enslaved persons in its wake. That Inatawi brings us to another feature of the autobiography. I triumphed. Head unbowed by the degradations of a lengthy enslavement, Herman Ross becomes after his emancipation, a man among men, homo inter homine sum, who walks around with his head uncovered, owes nothing to no one, has never been summoned to litigation, has never been publicly shamed in a confrontation over debt. His worth resides not only in the avoidance of social disgrace, but in the flexing of his agency as a free person in order to approve social capital, the purchase of land and expensive dishware, the acquisition of his own enslaved persons and of a pet dog, and the liberation of his contubernalis from slavery. The designation of his enslaved persons as Wiginti Wintrace and their pairing with an animal mark Hermeros' success at internalizing a foundational ideological premise of Roman slavery, that the enslaved black full person. The act that door opens the door to these is placed out of chronological order, but unsurprisingly is extolled as still another bragging point. Hermeros paid a thousand denarii for his freedom, which while approximately four times the base annual pay of a Roman legionary in the period of the satiricus composition, is, as several scholars have noted, not a high price for a slave, unquote. Although the available evidence for the price of freedom in the Roman world doesn't enable us to determine with certainty how plausible this figure is for the manumission of a person enslaved for 40 years, Herman Ross will have proceeded to his next steps in wealth acquisition on the basis of the peculium that he had amassed while enslaved, one that was not entirely liquidated by his purchase of freedom. These and other accomplishments are all held up as intersubjectively legible bases for Hermeros' hope that he will die in such a way as not to blush with distinction and respect. The prospect that the attainment of honor in the course of one's second life as a free person might not suffice to guarantee honor beyond the grave is of course not to be forced openly. What matters most for my psychosocial profile of Hermeros as a melancholic subject is both his fixation on the validation that is presumed to derive from these achievements and his acute awareness of the suffering that has to be endured for these achievements to matter, the wearer atla. 
the tincture of racial formation is detectable here as well, in the sense that Hermoros' upwardly mobile rhetoric turns on closer examination to parade the illusion that through labor and hard work, the free person can dislodge the stigmatization of their past. This is an illusion in as much as his labor credits and reauthorizes the system of domination that rests purely on an ontological differentiation between slave and free. He works hard to forget, to the extent that he can, his previous enfleshment as a non-human within the system. But the memories that attach to that body cannot be dispatched into forgetfulness by the purchase of glebulae or the acquisition of other objects. The laughter that he takes to be directed at him unnerves him because it threatens to expose him, not as enslaved in a hermetically sealable and therefore detachable past, but in the very present. That he responds by compulsively vaunting his achievements certifies him as permanently enthralled to the specter of his past enslavement. Some three decades ago, Hugh Lloyd Jones claimed that the attempt to psychoanalyze ancient imaginative writers or characters from their work um, has generally yielded meager fruit. What I hope to have shown in subjecting that second passage of Petronius to more painstaking scrutiny is that some strange fruit comes into view if we approach the satiric configuration of Hermeros as a race-making enterprise. It is, of course, important to keep in mind that the elite Roman author's introjection into the melancholic minds of free persons is complicated and in the end thwarted by at least two factors. The first is internal to the figuration of Hermeros' psychosis, whereas the second acts extrinsically as a narratological constraint. Internal to the styling of Hermeros as a free person is the presumption that he cannot resist the repetitive return to enslavement or spring himself free from the trap of its denigrations as visualized through metaphors of experimentality. The humor for an audience that is presumed to be reading from high to low originally originates precisely in Hermoros's inability to get over his trauma, with his reliance on a narrative of injury giving him away as irreparably injured. At the same time, the author's capacity to voice a free person's anguish quickly runs up against the ceiling. Hermoros doesn't have a melancholy that is traceable to a specific place, the original site of childhood subjection, whose self-sale, exposure, capture, and trafficking is veiled as provincial, but never otherwise specified. In this context, then, the melancholy of the ostensibly self-made person takes shape around the, uh, the silence of their unspecifiable, because irrecoverable, because embarrassing, origins. In the case of the satirica, are these origins irrecoverable because of the author's own deliberate and strategic disregards for the specificity of free person experiences, or because of the deracinating violences of Pattersonian social death, these questions may well be simply two sides of the same point. Although I've been mainly concerned with a literary representation of a free person's melancholic effect, my suspicion is that it is not difficult to perform a broadly similar exercise with other bodies of evidence. Epigraphic corpora in particular would be rich with opportunities. The myriad epitaphs of Liberty commemorating the Patroni, Cows in the appropriate honorific language of Benamarines or Alberta Aeus, or the overrepresentation of free persons in funerary inscriptions from the city of Rome itself. These could be taken as springboards for more analysis. Rather than gliding over their formulaic attributes, we could reap the benefits of seeing these inscriptions as implicated in the truly large scale and multimedia enterprise of ingraining and inculcating the justice and longevity of domination through funerary commemoration, and is showcasing the aggressiveness with which those enslaved individuals and families who reached liberty pursued the commemoration of themselves and their children. Further investigation of the specifically autobiographical properties of these epitaphs and the extent to which they mobilize racializing affects could yield conclusions broadly in step with Ray Chow's intuition that autobiographical writing, quote, is perhaps not simply a straightforward account about oneself, but more a symptomatic attempt born of coercive mimeticism and social interpolation to create access to a trans-individual narcissism to grow for a self-regard that does not yet exist. With the findings of this investigation in hand, one could then return to Hermeros and his fellow freedmen, creating life vignettes and tall tales and engaging in forms of mock or actual indignation and seek to parse 
their homosociality as an attempt to recover the respect that is structurally denied to them and to parse that homosociality and the melancholy that originates within it as a bond of shame, to borrow an apt phrase from Carlo Ginsburg. Moving in a different direction, but again with these fellow Friedman front and center, one could stretch up from the existence in Roman cultural spaces of a brown commons that was defined not so much by, and here I'll quote Jose Esteban Munoz, the formation of atomized brown subjects as by, quote, a kind of uncanny persistence in the face of distressed conditions of possibility. But these products will all have to weigh in the wings. For now, to summarize the ground that we've covered with this second passage. There is something that we can call a melancholic affect in the lives of Roman freed persons as staged in Petronius' Satirica. It is a disposition for managing and negotiating the grief of enslavement and manumission. This affect is a racial ontological signature. Its workings are perceptible in Petronius, Hermerus's finger-wagging blow-up at Eskiltos being one promising textual site for the reconstruction of this affect. It can be decomposed into two main elements, paranoia about being the butt of the joke and the reflexive turn to autobiography. This autobiographical turn is itself reducible to several discursive themes. The need to stake out an alternative path, the need to assert one's success of overcoming trauma, the need to praise the architects of that trauma as having done right by you at the end, and the need to ascribe dignity and purpose to an otherwise arbitrarily dehumanizing and crushing process that turns even those fortunate to survive it into warm breeding corpses. At the end of the day, Hermeros was not a person who remained disaffected, that emotional state newly endowed with rich theoretical texture by Xin Yao. It was a necessary condition of his past and present marginalization as a racialized being that he lived forever in his feelings. Thank you so much. <laughs>